Hello, my name is Dr. Shanda Blackman, and I'm a thoracic surgeon at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I wanted to visit with you today about one of the most complex things that patients having esophageal cancer or complex esophageal reconstruction suffer with, and that is complex esophageal reconstruction. Patients who have either an esophagus removed with the stomach removed or who have an esophagus removed and the stomach is not appropriate for recreation have a severe problem. Those patients need to have a new esophagus created out of something other than what we normally use, which is stomach. When the stomach cannot be used, we may use colon or small bowel. Both are viable options and some surgeons prefer colon and others prefer small bowel. I prefer small bowel when reconstructing the esophagus because it's the same size as the esophagus. It doesn't develop cancer like other parts of the colon might. It doesn't require a formal bowel prep and it doesn't have what we call senescent lengthening, which is where the parts of the colon get redundant and serpiginous, meaning it's in a circuitous pathway and it starts to fold on itself and become blocked. The small bowel interposition does also have peristalsis, which means that it squeezes and propels things down. That's good when you're eating because you want things to help get the food down. Sometimes though, when a food bolus goes into the small bowel, it might squeeze and push food up, which is why after small bowel reconstruction, we tell patients to consider that they might need to swallow three times so that when they fill the esophagus that's now made of small bowel up and it squeezes, they swallow again to continue to fill that small bowel so that it can push it on down. Sometimes when patients have esophagectomy, their recurrent laryngeal nerve is damaged. And when that happens, patients need to have that nerve treated. Either they have the injection to bring the vocal cord towards the center, or they might have speech pathology to help them swallow better. All of this is a really important part of getting ready to have a small bowel interposition to recreate your esophagus. Some people ask me, why do you do small bowel reconstruction? And that's because I like to solve problems in patients who have complex situations that probably a lot of other surgeons don't like to take care of. Patients who don't have a viable conduit and require small bowel recreation of their esophagus are complex in nature, have a lot of other problems, and require immense attention to detail. And that's what I think our team does best. All of our people on our team, the nurse practitioners, PAs, the nurses, our floor nurses, our partners in plastics and reconstructive surgery, especially Dr. Samir Mardini, our residents, our operating room staff, our anesthesia teams, our people in the clinic, all of them work together, especially the schedulers, getting these complex evaluations and reconstructions set up for the right time, the right place, and the right circumstance. When you come in to have small bowel recreation of your esophagus, you'll notice that your agenda may be packed. If you have esophageal cancer, you will have restaging of your esophageal cancer to make sure that it hasn't come back before we rebuild with small bowel. That may include, but not be limited to, a CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, pelvis. It may also include, but not be limited to, a CT arteriogram to recreate the arteriogram arteries to make sure that we have a good idea of what conduits are available to us for recreation, as well as a PET CT scan. A PET scan is basically a sugar scan where FDG is the sugar looking for any unusual uptake to indicate sites of metastatic disease. Once we've done that, we also have to do a pulmonary function test to evaluate your breathing. After the pulmonary test, we may do other tests to see if you're fit enough, meaning a ventilation perfusion scan, or even what's called a VO2 max study. Both of these tell us how much lung you can tolerate losing if a lung resection in addition to this is required, or if we just wanna know if you can tolerate the big surgery. Also, we might have to do brain MRI or abdominal MRI, looking at other sites where you might have nodules in the liver, nodules in the adrenal gland, or unusual findings in the brain to make sure there's no cancer before we do the reconstruction.
For those of you that are on immunotherapy, we might have to work on the timing of the immunotherapy. Many people after esophageal cancer might be placed on adjuvant nivolumab, and those people need a two-week break off the nivolumab before we plan the surgery. If you're on a blood thinner, we have to do some type of a bridge to help you come off of the blood thinner to appropriately clot so that you can have the surgery and then go back on your blood thinner after surgery. We may also do cardiac testing, including an EKG or an echocardiogram of your heart. Having your esophagus reconstructed is a stressful surgery and it's important that we make sure that we're looking at your entire body and making sure that your entire body can tolerate the reconstruction. We may also have you be seen by a nutritionist. And five days before the reconstruction surgery, frequently we'll recommend that you take immune nutrition shakes to optimize your nutrition and get you ready for the surgery with good building blocks, which are proteins, to help you build the tissue and heal. Additionally, we may test you with a prealbumin test to look at what your acute nutrition is like. And if your prealbumin is less than 17, we may have concerns about proceeding with the surgery. That's an indication of acute nutrition, and albumin is an, an indication of chronic nutrition. We may also check your blood count or a CBC, making sure that your platelet count and your hemoglobin are good enough to have surgery. We may choose to type and cross you, which means checking your blood to see if we need to have a match so that we could transfuse you with blood if needed, although this is extremely rare during these types of surgery, surgeries. Additionally, other tests and studies may be done to get you ready for your procedure. You will also need to be seen by me, as well as maybe one of the other thoracic surgeons who also can perform the surgery, as well as one of our plastic surgeons, especially Dr. Samir Mardini, who specializes in small bowel reconstruction. We've partnered together for the past eight or nine years and performed the surgery to be able to co solve complex problems for people who have GI discontinuity. At the time of your surgery, you may notice that you'll have quite a few incisions made. You'll have an incision on the neck and an incision on the abdomen at a minimum. If you have a feeding tube, we'll keep that to help with later nutrition. When you have your incision on the neck, it may extend down onto the chest for approximately five to six centimeters. Your end esophagostomy will be taken down and brought down to connect to the small bowel. The ostomy bag should not be on your chest after the surgery if the surgery was successful. We will bring the small bowel from the belly all the way up to the neck and connect it to the esophagus and take the blood supply from the upper part of the bowel and connect it to the blood supply from the inside of your chest or from the blood vessels in your neck. Inside your abdomen, we'll take down adhesions, open your abdomen, explore, make sure that there's no cancer present, and then we'll pay close attention to rerouting your bowel and focusing on those small mesenteric blood vessels that we'll lead, need to preserve to be able, be able to connect to the neck vessels to recreate good blood flow to your small bowel and give you a nice long straight jejunum to reconstruct your esophagus. That surgery takes approximately five to six hours to do and after the surgery you go to the recovery room. You spend about an hour in the recovery room and then you go to NASF 10 tower floor. Once you go up to the 10th floor of the NASF tower, you'll be given an opportunity to meet with our teams. We follow the merit pathway for recovery. This helps us to coach our residents, nurses, and teams to care for you in a consistent and meaningful manner following an evidence-based guided pathway. You may give it, be given monitors to monitor your heart rate, your blood pressure, your urine output, the output from your drains, as well as for feeding tubes, as well as chest tubes, as well as drains around your neck, as well as a Doppler monitor that's continuously monitoring the blood flow through your flap. After all those tubes and lines and drains are in place, we're gonna try to get you out of bed. We like to see if you can get up and walk around even the first or second day after surgery. We'd like to see you walking multiple laps around the nurse's station, indicating that you're recovering and you're strong and you're getting that blood flow going. When your GI tract starts to wake up and you start to have bowel activity, we'll start to feed you back through your feeding tube. You'll use your feeding tube for about three weeks until we're able to do a swallow and demonstrate that there's no leak, at which time you can start to eat by mouth. Also, we'll be making 
that sh making sure that our teams are with you to monitor for any bleeding, problems with blood flow, problems with your bowel getting too sleepy and not waking up, what we call an ileus, problems with low urine output that might be a sign of dehydration, or problems with atrial fibrillation, which means your heart's rapidly beating as a result of the stress from the surgery. All of these different problems we will attend to and try to optimize as we recover you from your small bowel interposition. Now, after you recover from your surgery, you'll be discharged and you'll use the feeding tube. That will happen for a couple of weeks before we do the esophagram to make sure that there's no leak. You'll follow up with us in the clinic with the esophagram, and if all is well, we begin you on a soft, mushy diet. That diet progresses on to other things as time goes by, and once you're able to maintain an oral diet, which means by the mouth, for one week, then we'll be able to stop the tube feeding, and then after the tube feeding has been stopped for about a week, we pull the tube, and when the tube's out, you don't need it anymore, and the hole closes. In summary, small bowel interposition, or supercharged pedicle jejunal interposition, which we call SPJ, is a complex surgery. Requires a huge team effort to evaluate you, optimize you, get you ready for surgery, take you through the surgery, and get you to recover. All of these things come together, and I hope that I can help you to answer any questions that you have. One of my passions in life is solving unique problems for patients with really complex problems, and this is definitely one of my favorite things to do. I hope I've answered your questions, and if you have any other further questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you again. My name is Shanda Blackman. My Twitter handle is Shanda Blackman at Twitter, and I'm available on multiple other ways, or you can call our office, 507-284-1517. Thank you again, and I'm proud to be a surgeon at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where we always put the patient first.